Hello. Hello, everyone. And first of all, thanks uh, for inviting us here. Uh, the location is beautiful. I see so many people uh, around, and that's amazing because uh, uh, they told us uh, it's the first time talking about Bitcoin. And I really, really hope that this is the only the first time uh, you're going to to start a lot of uh, appointments uh, just like that. So uh, I'm a little bit scared of the sharks uh, here, but uh, it's okay. Uh, my name is uh, Mirli Pony. Uh, I'm Italian, uh, but right now I'm living in uh, Switzerland, along with my husband, Giacomo Zuccomo, who is going to present uh, uh, later. And uh, what can I say about me? Um, I've always been a tech enthusiast uh, since I was a kid. Uh, but uh, when I grew up, uh, I decided to do something very, very different in my life. Uh, I studied uh, um, uh, linguistics and uh, I almost have a PhD in musicology and I worked as a, a vocal coach for so many years. But uh, I wanted to do computer science uh, since all my life. And uh, when I started to be interested in Bitcoin, um, I think it was uh, 2012, um, I was very, very interested. But I didn't quit uh, what I was doing uh, at the time. But I told Giacomo, oh, well, that's very interesting. You should do uh, something around that. And you should quit your job. Uh, luckily, Giacomo uh, listened to me, <laughs> and but I was um, I was not convinced. And then I came back to Bitcoin. It was probably around 2015, 2016, and uh, it was too late uh, for being rich, but very early, uh, early stage for being uh, being a Bitcoin supporter. So uh, back on the point. Uh, we decided to do, uh, actually, I wasn't there at the beginning, uh, three nerds in Milan, Italy. Uh, they were working uh, on Bitcoin by themselves and decided to work together uh, for their own project. One of those nerds uh, was Giacomo. The other two uh, uh, were Riccardo Casatta of Eternity Wall and Lores Nahuma of Green Address. They decided to start to work together and uh, to start uh, the Bitcoin Milan meetup. And they started very, very little. Uh, but that specific place, they started very small in uh, almost a basement of a co-working space. Uh, grew up, grew up, grew up. And uh, probably last year, uh, we have around so many people and 50, uh, 15 employees uh, and many projects uh, going on. I think it's uh, very, very difficult uh, uh, to make money doing something um, with Bitcoin. I mean, if you have bought Bitcoin in the past or if you are a good trader, you can do a lot of money with Bitcoin. But we are not those kind of people. We are not traders. Uh, we really don't care about uh, uh, Bitcoin price. And also, we are not, uh, we're not scammers. So it's very easy to do um, money with Bitcoin, w maybe with blockchain and things like that. You can scam people and say you are going to take uh, to the, uh, the person uh, the best project, but you have nothing behind. Uh, but in most of the cases, it's very, very difficult. So uh, Giacomo had a brilliant idea, idea uh, and the result, the result was BHB Network. So uh, in Bitcoin world, you have the experts. The real experts of Bitcoin, I would say they are less than 100, the 100 all over the world. Um, and they are uh, very peculiar because uh, uh, they are not startuppers, they are not typical uh, um, devs, uh, they are not either academic personalities. Uh, Bitcoiners are very proficient uh, in many skills altogether, cryptography, economics, uh, computer science, of course, and uh, they are scattered around, all around the world. And uh, one thing very specific to them is that uh, uh, many of them made money from Bitcoin at the beginning, so they don't need money. So why they can work for you? They want to work on their own specific project. 
also they are driven by ideolo ideology uh, behind Bitcoin, by ethics, uh, and not by money. And they have all the knowledge about Bitcoin. On the other hand of the equation, uh, you have the incumbents, uh, the potential clients for business. So you have uh, banks, uh, insurance companies, or any companies that have some IT department, the C-level uh, ask uh, them to do something blockchain-ish. They don't know how to do it uh, and what to do, but they have money, they have resources, uh, but they don't have any um, knowledge about Bitcoin. Actually, um, the situation is that they have uh, a negative knowledge. Uh, they have many misconceptions. They think that blockchain is something uh, magic that will change the world. If you have the word, uh, if you had the, the word blockchain uh, in a project, uh, the value is higher, and you can say that with the blockchain you can uh, have uh, everything uh, uh, faster, cheaper, efficient, more efficient, and whatever. And that's not true. Blockchain is not uh, something like that. It's very specific to Bitcoin, but I'm not going to into details. And actually, this presentation uh, is going to um, describe uh, what uh, we have done in the past, we are doing now, we do in the future. Giacomo will talk about uh, the political uh, and ideological roots uh, of Bitcoin. But I, I think many of you have questions about uh, how Bitcoin works uh, and how the technology works uh, and you can save all the questions uh, uh, for later so we are going to go there but don't ask uh, us uh, how to make money because uh, we don't know and uh, uh, there's not going something like that I'm so sorry <laughs> so what we have done uh, something very creative it worked for many years and uh, it was this arbitrage box so uh, basically we took the money, the resources from the incumbent, we used the money to create a place, the BHB network, a physical place in Milan, where all these experts uh, were invited by us, we paid uh, their accommodation, we paid everything for their sort of vacation in Milan, but actually they stay in the lab, uh, shared the knowledge with us, Absolutely, they were uh, constant to, uh, to do that. Uh, we had the occasion to, to make them meet uh, together and uh, work on their project, work on the interoperability of their project. So we had the, the, best, the best knowledge uh, around Bitcoin we could have. And then to, uh, we packed uh, this knowledge, uh, we make it understandable for the incumbents. Uh, uh, for, for the first time, they had uh, the knowledge about Bitcoin, but the knowledge uh, about uh, uh, the news, about uh, the, the really disruptive uh, potential of the technology. And so they used it for proof of concept, uh, for uh, uh, other, other projects, uh, and they use it not to be scammed, not to lose money. Actually, that was uh, our goal because they could save uh, a lot of money knowing that they don't need any blockchain at all. It's, it seems so easy because if I come to you and I say, you don't need a blockchain, don't do anything, uh, don't pay me. But they really wanted to do something. They really want to do something. And it's very, very hard to explain that they don't need a blockchain. We need a lot of math, a lot of resources, a lot of uh, people telling them so. So this is our, our past, uh, I would say it was uh, glorious. I'm, I'm so proud of what we have done. Uh, I was the organizer of uh, more than 50 uh, Bitcoin Milan Meetup, and uh, we had uh, so many important personality with occasion to meet them. Uh, the Meetup, it was just an occasion like that. Uh, like this one, sorry. Um, we started very little, probably 10 people. And then at the end, we didn't have a place uh, uh, for, uh, for people. So we, we thought to, to do um, twice appointments uh, at the mo uh, every month. So um, what can I say? We, we are still doing some meetup, but uh, um, not every month. Uh, it's uh, a little bit tricky right now. Um, but uh, all the knowledge is around on the internet, so it's able. 
We organized the Scaling Bitcoin Meetup in 2016. That was a very important moment for us because it was uh, at that moment uh, probably the most important conference uh, in the Bitcoin world. And uh, it happened in our city with, uh, uh, with our resources. And they created the Demilem protocol. The Milan protocol is very important for Lightning Network. Uh, the Lightning Network is, uh, uh, is the most important technology that is uh, uh, running right now for Bitcoin. It makes uh, Bitcoin uh, to scale and probably it will make it more accessible for everyone. And it's already, it's already happening, but in 2016, it was just an idea. There were many companies, uh, competing companies, working on these uh, uh, lightning uh, specifications, but we managed to uh, make them all together meeting in Milan. And what happened was that uh, they, they found a protocol, they found uh, the uh, specific choices they needed to do uh, to get interoperability. This is a very important point of Bitcoin. People are not competing just in the other field. Yes, they are competing, but they are searching for interoperability. They are really uh, driven by making Bitcoin really work and work better uh, for everyone. So at the end, they created this protocol. It's, uh, after that, they call it the Bolt protocol that made Lightning Network possible, and it happened all around our eyes. And everything is uh, these uh, uh, these devs are uh, pro open source projects. It's very difficult to make money when everything is open source, as you can imagine. But it's possible. Another incredible moment, Peter Todd is one of the most important uh, dev in Bitcoin, created uh, in our lab, uh, not created, <laughs> he created uh, the open time stamps uh, standard many years before, but uh, we made it possible providing uh, him uh, great other devs uh, uh, to work uh, with him on the project and helped him with money and a lot of stuff, of course, a lot of food too, it's very important. Uh, we are in Italy. We were based in Italy, so uh, pizza was uh, everywhere. And uh, yes, uh, this is a very important RGB protocol. Uh, we are working on that. It makes possible to use uh, assets uh, and um, and other uh, other kind of uh, tokens on uh, Latin network, on top of Latin network. And Aleko Spilini and Giacomo Zucco uh, are specific, uh, specifically work on them. This is the Lisbon conference and so on. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, could sound very, a very stupid project, uh, but I think it's very important, so I decided to add. Uh, Scancoin Bot, I'm the proud uh, creator of Scancoin Bot. Scancoin Bot is, uh, uh, is a button. If you push this button, it creates a tweet with a new ICO, with a new uh, coin, with a new white paper. So it's, uh, it's based on uh, artificial intelligence or artificial ignorance, I don't know. <laughs> and it's super easy. You want to show how easy it is to create a white paper. It's super, super easy. And if you read the white papers, for example, or the academic uh, papers or all the projects uh, that Scamcoin bot created, they seem very, very, very realistic. And this is kind of scary if you think uh, in, retros in retrospective. I have to say that uh, everything was possible also because I, I collaborated with uh, an incredible dev, Valeri Vaccaro, who helped me in creating the Scamcoin bot. And also Scamcoin bot is very famous right now. And I have uh, to say that somebody's come at the Scamcoin bot and somebody who is present here and uh, created a project a different project uh, he knows about it. Uh, it's just some kind of personality. It sounds like a very, I mean, uh, silly jokes, but really people could understand with Scamcoin Bot how many scams there were around. Yes, uh, people are, 
were and are still are losing a lot of money because of bad de decision about uh, other coins that are different uh, uh, from Bitcoin. I'm not saying that every other coin is not legit, but I'm saying that. So <laughs> if you have to buy something and invest only uh, what you are willing to lose, even with Bitcoin, point and, uh, and, and think of Bitcoin, nothing else. Yeah, yes, I said that. Okay. The present. Uh, uh, we had a baby uh, the last April, so we needed to, to stop a little bit all of these uh, incredible activities. I have so many babies, my nerds, uh, to take care of, but right now I have, a, I have a daughter, and we moved to Switzerland, so unfortunately we had to close the lab in Milan. It was very, very sad, and we are missing that place every day. But uh, still, we see uh, a very bright future. And uh, we decided to do something uh, that we are still not sure about, but it's working a lot so far. Uh, and it has been to divide the consultancy part. So Blockchain Lab right now is the consultancy part and is based in Switzerland. It's pure consultancy for our clients. and. Uh, BHB Network uh, is a part of the B, so it's a non-profit uh, uh, project, and uh, we wanted something even uh, freer than uh, BHB Network for the future. We want to, to sponsor the Bitcoin project, we really believe. We want to involve all the people and all the best projects uh, uh, scattered in all around the globe. So it's very ambitious. We received a lot of critics uh, for that, uh, and that's a very healthy thing. Uh, we, uh, I would say, it's still work in progress, uh, and um, Let's see what happens in the future. We are very ambitious. We are not going to stop. We really believe in Bitcoin. And uh, yes, I guess uh, if you have uh, any questions, you can uh, ask me whatever you want at the end of presentation uh, of Giacomo's presentation. And right now, Giacomo is going to, uh, to tell you about uh, why we are so passionate about Bitcoin. So please join Giacomo. Thank you very much. So now you know everything about uh, me as well because uh, we did this together and so we were there to, to create these things that Mir told you about. Uh, I'm the other guy working on all this. I'm a theoretical physicist and uh, formerly in theory and I was a consultant for Accenture for a while and now I work uh, full time in Bitcoin since 2013 because my wife uh, proposed me to do that. So uh, she was right. Uh, so in, in this talk, I would like to talk about the political roots of Bitcoin. The reason that I'm going to talk about politics is that uh, uh, many people start from the assumption that Bitcoin is mostly a technological revolution. And we think that uh, starting from this assumption, you don't get the phenomenon right. You basically don't understand uh, the reasons for many design choices in Bitcoin. You don't, get, you don't understand the reason for many fights inside the Bitcoin development teams. You don't understand also the implication and, and some kind of uh, uh, cultural reference of the story. So uh, now I'm going to list uh, some political or cultural uh, roots and traditions. You may well disagree with one or mo one, more than one of them. Uh, statistically, you will. I would be very surprised if, if there was um, more than two people in this room that was completely committed with all the very different and, and, uh, and, and diverse political cultures that merged together into the Bitcoin new subculture. But it's very important to know uh, which which one they are and what are where are they coming from basically to understand what is Bitcoin to, supposed to do in theory, what is managing to do in the in practice, and what we could expect in the future, both in a scenario of uh, of a failure or in a scenario of success. Uh, so Bitcoin is mostly a political revolution, as ambitious uh, as ambition and uh, as a design and as requirements, as limitation, and as risk, and attack vectors. Uh, Bitcoin has uh, 
uh, a technological stack. I'm not going, I mean, unless there is somebody very interested in the technological aspect that can just ask in the Q&A moment uh, something specific, I will not uh, enter in any details about, about this. This is just a representative slide uh, explaining that there are kind of four big blocks uh, of technology used in Bitcoin. And only, the f the, and only two of them, the peer-to-peer -peer layer, the transmission distributor layer, and the digital signature layer are typically and almost exclusively uh, technological, uh, technological pieces of, of, uh, of architecture. While um, uh, the most important part, so the, the coin base with the inflation schedule, the issuance schedule of the money, and the blockchain as a consensus mechanism among different people to reach consensus, these are mostly a political investment by Satoshi Nakamoto. So uh, they are pieces of technology that manage to work uh, uh, using economic incentive and the game theory among the participants. So uh, you have to imagine Bitcoin more like, uh, 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 like a, a board game which is designed to, made, to make people uh, agreeing over certain, certain rules that as a byproduct also produce some kind of new form of money uh, based on deep political knowledge and very interesting political assumption. Also, the, uh, the implications of Bitcoin, if you really think about a future in which Bitcoin is successful, the implications you are going to see are not just technological implications. It's not that with Bitcoin we're going to have faster computers or, uh, or uh, I don't know, cheaper cell phones. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about things like permissionless saving. Right now, if you want to save the wealth of your family, uh, in Germany, probably you can do that with, uh, with uh, uh, relatively low uh, b uh, effort. While if you don't want to do the same uh, in Afghanistan and you happen to be a woman, and so you cannot open a bank account, or if you want to save your wealth in Venezuela, and it's illegal to save your wealth into something else from the, the Venezuelan Bolivar that's going to probably depreciate to, a, to an incredible rate every week. So uh, in these corner cases that are a little bit far from our privilege point of view here in Europe, uh, s permissionless saving is going to change a lot of things for a lot of people around the world, if it works, of course, if Bitcoin is going to serve that. Then there is permissionless commerce. Uh, permission, I, I put a little image just to scare you about the, the very dark face of the permissionless commerce, which is the famous Silk Road. I don't know how many of you knew, knew about the Silk Road uh, website. And how, how many of you heard about the Silk Road? Well, most of you. Uh, of course, just for a friend and for a cousin, not, not directly, I, I guess. Uh, but uh, the, this is like the, the typical dark market. So uh, there is a way online to uh, to talk with people about things that are forbidden, that are that are illegal uh, in many places. For example, if you want to trade uh, for uh, recreative substances that are illegal in some jurisdiction, there are some uh, dark places in the web uh, over Tor where you can do that. But actually, the interesting thing about permission and co commerce is that. Uh, uh, the, the, the black market is a very small part of something very, very big, which is called the, the gray market, which is the market of all that, those inter economical and commercial interaction among people that are not specifically li licensed by a specific government to do that kind of transaction. Let's assume, uh, let's assume the fact that in order to transact, all, so internet is great. In a, with internet, you can match demand and offer of uh, merchants and, and customers around the world. So everybody can talk with everybody. But when they are done talking and when they want to finally exchange, uh, one of them, actually both of them, they will have to use a payment system. The payment system is usually PayPal, credit card, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Venmo, uh, Cash App, whatever. They are require a banking identity. So they are requiring KYC, AML, compliance. So you have to have a bank identity. Uh, they, they gr they, the majority, the net majority of people on this planet don't have a bank identity. So the, the great part of people living today on this planet, they are just cut out 
of e-commerce global wise because they cannot acce uh, access to the normal system of payment because uh, regulators are re requiring a very strict rule in order to access and that's creating a great what is called financial exclusion. So permissionless commerce is not, not, not just about uh, uh, two guys in uh, Regensburg, uh, Regensburg buying something that they are not supposed to buy by the local regulation. It's mostly about, about people outside here far away that are just transacting with normal things, uh, useful goods or services, but they don't have the permission to open a bank account by the current regulation. So this is another very important political implication. Then there is permissionless finance, which is which for somebody is even scarier than permissionless commerce. It's like uh, right now finance is very uh, it's very important in the in the world. It's, uh, it's basically dominant in the world. It created a, gi a giant crisis in 2008 and so on. But it's very heavily regulated. Uh, with Bitcoin and derivative technologies, you could actually witness to a finance which is hard, too impossible to effectively regulate and stop and limit somehow. This could sound like a nightmare for somebody or maybe like a dream for somebody else, not just for, for a... Uh, for a selfish uh, uh, Gordon Gecko kind of reason, like I'm going to make money with permissionless finance, but also for ideological reason, there are some crazy people that actually do think that the market without regulation would uh, avoid the crisis like 2008 instead of making them worse. Uh, you, you should, I mean, I will get into details later, but there is this kind of crazy people. And uh, then there is like censorship resistance. You have to know that uh, right now, if you go on a website called Eternity Wall, which is what uh, Mir was telling you about, uh, the one of the first guys in BHB was the guy created Eternity Wall. Eternity Wall is a website. You write uh, a little, a very short sentence, like a tweet, and you uh, and this website will help you to uh, to basically uh, write this sentence inside the Bitcoin transaction. The Bitcoin transaction will get mined by miners, and it will be basically impossible to delay to delete this sentence forever until somebody will manage to shut down every Bitcoin node in the on the planet forever so uh, unless uh, people is able to destroy Bitcoin this sentence is impossible to 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 destroy this means that uh, or our cur current ideas about uh, uh, the right to oblivion online the the, the right to be forgotten uh, censorship like uh, what if you write uh, on on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, some insult to uh, the leader of uh, the Republic of North Korea. Um, he, he will not be happy. Maybe you are uh, you are you right there that he is fat. It, of course, he's not. He's just strong boned. But uh, uh, but what if you write that? Uh, he will try to get you censored, but he can't because uh, you really have to physically destroy any single bit no Bitcoin node inside the homes of everybody. What if you write down something which is not supposed to be written down, which is considered offensive by current uh, political uh, consensus? Well, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. You can take down a website. You cannot effectively take, for now at least, uh, uh, as long as it's working, Take down Bitcoin. Of course, don't get the idea that you can write everything. I mean, there is there is people presenting projects for uh, Facebook on the blockchain. It, it doesn't work. Uh, the blockchain, as Mir said, is a very the Bitcoin blockchain is a very inefficient, uh, slow, uh, expensive tool. It mostly works in order to to move Bitcoin around. And these kind of users are very uh, are very are like an interesting side effect. Then there is the, another uh, political implication, which is a strong incentives, incentives for, uh, for good OPSEC. OPSEC mean, means like uh, operational security. It means people caring for storing their password correctly, storing uh, people encrypted their messages in order to not be spied upon. So right now, we talk about the, 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 tech, the tech giants spying on us like Alexa knows what we, what we want, what we do, and Facebook is selling our personal data around, and the government, NSA, is spying everybody. But the reality is that, yeah, that, that's something nasty they are doing, but nobody really cares. No, nobody really cares enough in order to establish good policies. So people are still using 123 as a password. People are still sending messages on platforms that are not encrypted. People is, is right now prioritizing uh, uh, comfort over security, comfort over privacy, 
because we are lazy, and uh, at least in Europe, at least uh, in these decades, we don't remember what, what does it mean to be under a, a dangerous political situation because we are, ki we are kind of quiet in Europe right now. And so we, we think that privacy is not important, that security is not important. But uh, when you start to play with money, direct money, non, not bank uh, fake money, that uh, somebody can steal from your account, so you call the, 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 the support, the customer care, and they can reverse the transaction. Not credit card that can be stolen, so somebody will, will spend, and then you will call the credit card company, company and they will just reverse the transaction. We are talking about a, a beer instrument, something that, which is just like a gold Kruger run, something that you take, you, you keep in your pocket, and if you give it to somebody, and that somebody goes away. There is no way to revert it. There is no way to take it back because it's a beer instrument. It's like a natural physical thing. Just is not physical. It's digital, but it's not. It's completely independent from third parties, uh, uh, regulators, guardians, uh, police, uh, politicians, and stuff like that. So, right now. People that never, that was never really interested in encrypting their private information, in selecting good passwords, in 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 keeping their computer or their cell phone secure. Now with Bitcoin, they are interested suddenly. Uh, I don't know how many. Let's let's get an, uh, let's try another poll. How many of you? Well, that's not a good OPSEC question. I was asking how many of you got Bitcoin, but but if you are good OPSEC people, you will not raise your hand. So I will not ask it. Uh, but uh, I'm, I suppose that some of you try to, to buy and store some Bitcoins. Now, you should know that if you, uh, for example, take the, the seed, so the, the let's say the, the original key, the private, uh, the secret uh, information to secure your wallet, and you put the seed on, a, uh, for example, an uh, uh, iCloud or a Google Drive uh, service, probably somebody will steal your Bitcoin in, uh, in a couple of days. Why? Because there are, there are people that are running bots in order to, to try to steal Bitcoin inside the companies that are running uh, iCloud or, or Google Drive, because it's natural, because there, there is no way to, to stop them or to track them or to uh, take back the money. So people are starting to really care for this. Some people, of course, not everybody. But Bitcoin is making interesting to start uh, getting your privacy right and your security right. And when you already have the knowledge and the instrument and the tool in order to secure your privacy, your communication, then maybe you're starting to use the same tools for other things. For example, your your mails, your messages, and then even people spying on you uh, on normal co or normal, normal communication channel, uh, they will start to have a lot of troubles to continue spying on you because uh, basically Bitcoin is teaching people how to uh, to uh, to to treat their computers in a way that makes that in a way that makes some sense. Uh, so uh, there are also I'm not going to talk uh, about it, this at length. Also, I already gave a speech about this in Prague. So you can, if you if you are interested in this, you can find it online. There is a you, you use my name Giacomo Zucco plus uh, uh, political attack vectors on Bitcoin, and you find uh, this uh, speech in Prague in 2017 about uh, uh, this political. Uh, but the, the reason of this slide uh, is just to uh, just to communicate to you that many of the failure scenario of Bitcoin are not technical, not bugs uh, or technical problems, but are actually political uh, attacks on Bitcoin by, by nation states or by hackers or by central banks or whatever. So let's get into the, the, the center of the, of the presentation. Uh, of course, uh, I will try to simplify uh, in a, a little bit, actually a lot. Uh, the, the history here, so I will, f I will try to take a history which is very long and very complex uh, and brutally simplify it in order to make a point. So uh, don't take anything I'm say saying right now as a, a super uh, accurate division. But I, 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 I did like to, uh, to try to understand which ones are the, uh, the, the political cultures that merge together in order to create Bitcoin and to uh, tell you a little bit about this political culture, what, what is their story, their history, their, uh, their uh, important names, uh, uh, important books, uh, so that you can understand a little bit where all this stuff is coming from and how they did just merge together in order to create uh, this very strange political beast uh, disguised as a technological beast, which is actually Bitcoin. 
So the first one, uh, I, I, I call these political cultures with these strange names. The first, I call it hard money. The second, dark money. The third, open money. And the last one, smart money. Uh, the first one, hard money, AKA, also known, known as uh, the Austrian. Uh, this is the, uh, I don't know if somebody here um, maybe uh, due to linguistical, uh, uh, linguistical uh, closeness uh, was able to read some uh, textbooks from the uh, famous uh, uh, Austrian School of Economic. Basically, I'm talking about uh, this, uh, these, uh, these authors mostly writing in German starting since the, the early 19th century. Uh, they are Karl Menger, uh, von Boker, Bauker, uh, von Mises, uh, von, von Hayek, uh, and then some American uh, authors like uh, Rothbard. And recently, the most famous uh, uh, author from this, uh, from this uh, uh, alternative economic school. You have, you have to consider the economic, um, the economic school, the Austrian economic school, is like a non-mainstream alternative uh, economic uh, school of thought. So there are some people that actually think that uh, uh, that the the market uh, is able to produce and manage the good that we call money better than politicians. Uh, so that's the the most. Uh, the, the, of course, uh, this is an ideological statement, but there is a lot of uh, uh, scientific debate around that. So you should not just state that you think that the, the people should manage money as a market tool and not politicians. But you can also argue what happens if that, uh, uh, I mean, what happened historically if that's the case? I mean, the the, 30, the 29 crisis in the US, the stock market crisis, was that created because of a lack of regulation of money? So inflation, deflation, deflation cycles, uh, in, um, uh, interest rates, uh, manipulation, uh, b uh, boom and burst, uh, all these kind of theories uh, I will I mean I would suggest everybody interested in uh, to ask any question maybe at the end of this presentation or even better to start reading some of these books for example you have uh, the origin of money which is a great book uh, written by Karl Menger uh, there is also like uh, denationalization of money by, by Freddy von Hayek which is a very interesting book by the the Nobel Prize von Hayek uh, and the, there is also by Murray Rothbard uh, what has our government done to our money? This is written in English, uh, but basically the the bottom line of this uh, of this political culture is this: uh, money was created by the people uh, as a market tool, not by politician, not by government. Uh, people started to exchange in barter. Then they started to select those goods in the barter that were more saleable. So uh, gold emerged as a very good form of money. So some powerful people start to impress their image over gold with with uh, coinage in order to make easier to uh, to validate and to and to um, yeah to validate uh, and to avoid counterfeiting. Uh, and then people started to ban gold. So in the beginning of 20th century, uh, um, Roosevelt. Uh, ba basically made the possession of gold illegal uh, in the US and the same happened in Europe and basically the political system started to make illegal for people to trade in the natural money which was gold, physical gold. And the interesting thing is that uh, this, this school of thought is, uh, is a school of thought that uh, uh, basically the, the, the political message is the gold standard was good and the new fiat money with uh, hyperinflation, with uh, uh, business cycles, uh, with uh, boom and burst and crisis, uh, this is bad. But uh, there is one part missing in this, in, in this kind of culture, which is uh, we cannot use gold anymore as a meaningful way to interact in a new information-based economy. I mean, you could go around with, coin, with gold coins in uh, probably in the 15th century. It's not just uh, that difficult to believe. You go around, you pay with your coins, and you are set. But now you are, or you are basically paying stuff on Amazon. And it's very difficult to, to send somehow with some pigeon or whatever gold coins. I mean, a pigeon will get shot probably with, uh, with money. Uh, so uh, it's, it's very difficult to use physical gold in the information era. It was easy to use it in the physical, uh, dominantly physical era. But in the information era, we cannot just get back to gold. We need something new. Uh, state money, government money is great because being, being virtual, 
Uh, th th it's funny that somebody calls Bitcoin virtual money. Actually, 93% of the monetary base of Euro are just bits on a computer database. So Euro, except for the, some coin and very few uh, monetary base uh, in paper, which is just a very, very small part, same goes for American dollar, uh, they are, uh, mostly they are virtual, so they only exist inside computers. The difference between Bitcoin and, and those is which, who controls the computers. Uh, in the case of, of, of Euro and, and the US dollar, it's a central bank, so basically it's a politician or a bureaucrat appointed by some politicians. In the case of Bitcoin, is uh, everybody or nobody, depending on how, how you want to see it. And uh, uh, so the idea is gold is better because it's hard money. What does hard money mean? Hard money means uh, uh, money which, uh, which is, whose supply is very difficult to manipulate. So imagine that uh, uh, you own some gold. Uh, sure, somebody can open a new gold mine in Africa, so they can maybe increase the production of gold a little bit, but the produ production of gold right now is something like 1% uh, of the total stock of gold every year. And you, as you know, gold doesn't depreciate, it's very res resistant, it stays, it stays the same basically forever, chemically speaking. Uh, so the amount of gold in the market is huge compared to the amount of gold produced by new mines. So if I open up a new mine, I don't really change the value of that gold. I cannot manipulate the price. While if you're talking about euro or US dollars or even worse, uh, Venezuelan uh, Bolivar or, uh, or pesos or, uh, or, uh, or the, the, um, the German uh, marks of the Weimar Republic, uh, you know that it's very, very easy to hyperinflate, manipulate, to print money, basically. Politicians as a button to print money. They give money for, to the first uh, row, row of people. This first row of people gets a lot of benefits because they have new money. So let's, let's imagine. Uh, imagine that you have in your basement a, a, a machine that prints fa uh, con counterfeited euros. Uh, you get rich because you can spend those. But it's not that everybody gets rich, because if, if that was the case, then we should just distribute uh, Euro printer in every basement and everybody would be millionaire. The problem is that, yeah, everybody will be millionaire, but uh, with millions of things that, that don't have any purchasing power anymore. So the last people in the chain of new money, they get nothing. They get just inflation. And the first people in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the row, they get the new money produced. Right now, when the central bank um, prints money, uh, they use it to, uh, to pay, uh, to buy the, the debt for national governments, which, in, in, uh, which are going to, to give some kind of, uh, uh, well, I, I'm going too long about this. But this is, as you can, as you can imagine, this is a very economical uh, uh, line of thought. It's, it's nothing about uh, drugs on the internet or about uh, computer science. It's very, it's very uh, pure economics. So uh, there is a second, uh, second line of thoughts that I call the dark money, which is a very difficult, uh, a very different political culture uh, that uh, traditionally didn't really overlap with the first one anyhow. So it's not that people uh, discussing the dark money in the 1990s where Austrian school people, they didn't care about gold mostly, they didn't care about inflation, they didn't care about the things that I, I told you about in the, previous, uh, in the previous slide. So this was a completely separate uh, political culture. I called it uh, dark money, uh, AKA the cypherpunk. So cypherpunk is basically an interesting, uh, an interesting word, you know that uh, you know what cyberpunk is, this is a, a literary definition. Cyberpunk is that science fiction, uh, science fiction, uh, let's say, uh, style in which you have a future which is very dark and dominated by very big uh, Orwellian governments and very big corporation, a little bit like uh, some, uh, uh, you know, the Neuromancer by Gibson and, and some Philip Dick and, and stuff like that. So uh, cypher, uh, cyberpunk was uh, a, a, an idea, a science fiction literary idea of a very dark dystopian future of uh, people dominated by super powerful powerful and, uh, and all-powerful institutions. Cypher mean, means uh, uh, 
uh, code for encryption. So a cipher is uh, the code that you use to encrypt things and to decrypt things. A cipher is a secret, is, a, is, a, is an encryption secret. And so uh, these people started to gather around and they called themselves in the, in the early 90s and they called themselves the cypherpunk. These people was, uh, was uh, a group of uh, computer experts uh, who thought that uh, the only way to, to avoid a dark uh, cyberpunk kind of future was uh, through cryptography and encryption, because uh, if you can preserve uh, your secrets, then the all-powerful government or corporation will not be able to enslave you, because uh, they will not know who you are physically, so they cannot come to your home to take away your, your staff or your loved ones or take you to, the, to, to, the, to, the, to jail, because uh, you just interact over the internet. So the, uh, the, the, the names that you should take a look at are David Chaum, David Chaum created a system uh, in, uh, in 1990 called uh, eCash that was very similar, I mean, it had something similar to what Bitcoin became uh, 18 years later. Uh, there is a paper in 1985 by David Chaum which is called Security Without Identification, Transaction Systems to Make Big Brother Obsolete. Uh, so it was a, a, a line of thought starting in the 80s actually about how to make the, the, the big brother uh, go away or how to make it, how to outsmart the big brother. And if you read other things like uh, Timothy Mate wrote uh, The Art of Not Being Governed or The Crypto Anarchy uh, virtual and virtu Crypto Anarchy and Virtual Communities or The Cypheronomicon that are, uh, you can find those texts online. Those are, those are texts written in the late 80s, early 90s, but they are incredibly uh, like uh, they are like uh, Nostradamus, uh, like uh, uh, impressive uh, 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 as as for predictions and forecasts. Because the point of of these of these people is, right now uh, we are few people using the internet to do stuff. But someday everybody will use the internet for everything. And when people will use the internet for everything, then uh, the big governments and big corporations will be able to spy upon everybody. Uh, of, uh, of course, they will spy our messages, but especially they will spy our uh, expense, expenses and, and money transfers, which are even more sensitive than messages. If you think about that, talk is cheap. So you can write to your friend, uh, yeah, you're my best friend, but then the, the bills uh, of, uh, of your expenses going every weekend with the other friend in another place are more telling than your cheap words. You can you can say uh, yeah I'm uh, I'm 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 healthy uh, uh, I'm super healthy but then the the medical bills for your embarrassing disease are more telling than your words about your health or maybe you you maybe you are compliant with the line of the party publicly but secretly you are funding some kind of dissident organization with money and that money uh, or, or maybe you want to escape from, from North Korea and from Venezuela, and what you have to do first is to move the wealth of your family away. And so that movement uh, talks more eloquently than your, than your uh, promises that you will not leave and you, you will not uh, change your, uh, your residency. So uh, uh, governments and corporations that can spy about my communication can understand what I say, which is already pretty bad, but especially can understand what I spend on, which is even worse. And if you think about that, th they were very, very uh, good forecasters because uh, right now, uh, even if our uh, written privacy is low, I mean, everything you, r you write probably get uh, read by somebody at the NSA, but there is too much people on the world to, to get everybody in trouble about that. So uh, data mining is very difficult. But uh, if you think about your privacy in the financial and commercial sector, uh, banks, em uh, I mean, credit card employees, uh, fintech company employees, uh, commercial bank employees, and government agency employees, they know everything every single move that you do with your finance. There is zero privacy when you try to do a bank, uh, and that's getting worse every single day. If you try to do a bank uh, a wire transfer, they will ask you why to who, and, and this is not like, uh, it's not angels asking you, it's not robots asking you, it's human beings, bureaucrats or employee of the bank, with uh, a great amount of power 
over you because they know everything you do with your money. So these people were concerned about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the fact that uh, money in the past, it was dark. So it was not shedding a light over your identity. You go in a place, you want uh, some kind of food, you give some gold to the guy, the guy gives you food, uh, you depart, you don't care who he is. I mean, maybe you do care who he is because you want to know if the food is good. So for the merchant, reputation is important. But for the buyer, as long as you pay uh, in front, up front, reputation is, if you ask for credit, then yes, your reputation is very important. But if you don't ask for credit and you pay up front, uh, the merchant doesn't need to know who you are. He just gives you something, takes something, and then you're set. But in the new internet-based payment uh, era, everybody is completely enslaved by a super powerful network of information about his private uh, decisions and, uh, and habits and, and whatever. So this is the second kind of, uh, uh, of group called the cypherpunks. Uh, uh, of course, Timothy May, Eric Hughes, uh, that wrote the Cypherpunks Manifesto, uh, John Gilmore, uh, uh, Jude Mil Milhon, uh, Adam Beck. Adam Beck is still working on Bitcoin right now. Is the creator of one of the technology used in Bitcoin, Ash Cash, and he was famous because uh, 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 there was a time in the in the early 90s in which uh, cryptography was still considered, so cryptography technology was considered a weapon by the US government. And so if you were go crossing the border with some kind of cryptographic uh, computer program, you were actually liable of uh, being jailed uh, by military court because you were exporting weapon to uh, abroad. So Adam Beck started to print shirts with a very, very compact way, uh, it took a computer program that was decrypting uh, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, uh, of cipher, and he printed the program on a T-shirt, and he started selling this T-shirt as a as an act of civil resistance. And so people were basically dressing this T-shirt and crossing the border, exporting cryptography technology. And some of them were uh, had a problem with uh, with uh, the TSA and uh, and uh, and the marshal, and some of them, uh, and then they won the battle and the US government stopped considering information as uh, a weapon. Uh, and that was a very historical, uh, that no, nobody knows about because it was very fringe, it was very uh, niche. Not, not popular, gen general population doesn't know a lot of this story, but they are very interesting. And uh, the, the, least, the last one of these people is Julian Assange, that was actually part, the creator of WikiLeaks, the guy now in basically in prison uh, in, in this embassy in London is uh, because he exposed some kind of uh, not very nice uh, things made by the U.S. military, like uh, uh, like uh, killing uh, children from an helicopter. That was something that was not very well received by the U.S. military, and so uh, he is one of these guys. They basically uh, WikiLeaks. If you think about it, is not really about uh, protecting the privacy of people is more like uh, destroying the privacy of governments. So there was also this double aspect in cypherpunk, uh, in cypherpunk uh, um, culture. The idea was we have to make in normal people, innocent people, uh, uh, able to protect their secrets, and we have to make powerful institutions unable to protect their secrets. So we want transparency for the powerful, and we want uh, secrecy and privacy for the for the weak and for the for the little guy, which is uh, the one that suffers more if it gets uh, uh, if it gets controlled by the powerful. So the third the third uh, kind of uh, this is a less less dark uh, part of uh, of my presentation. This is a little bit more uh, less political, if you want. But there was a lot of political fight about this as well, which is the idea of open money, and I called it AKA the nerd. So this is the history about the open source movement or free software movement. So uh, I, I guess that many of you interested in technology already knows a lot about this, but the bottom line is this. During the early ages of uh, information technology, computer, te uh, computer science, every, every part, every single piece of software was usually public knowledge. So uh, there were scientists in universities uh, creating programs and just distributing programs uh, as a scientific, uh, imagine the scientific papers right now. You, you discover something, you publish it, and you discuss it with the scientific community. That's not exactly how it goes always, but 
it, it should be uh, how it goes. So you publish it and you disclose it and you share it. So basically, uh, with computer science, it was actually the same, uh, but that ch started to change a little bit uh, during the 80s. Uh, basically, you started to have companies pro uh, keeping their uh, source code secret and only distribute, distributing the, uh, the, 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 um, the executable program with uh, some kind of uh, regulation that was uh, basically for forbidding you from, uh, uh, from modifying or distributing again the, uh, the, 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 source, the source code. So um, the, the open source uh, movement started with uh, Richard Stallman of, uh, you know, the, the GNU uh, Linux uh, license. Uh, and then with Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. You can think that this stuff are not very interesting, but actually every single server you're using right now basically runs over Linux. Every cell phone that you're using is running on Android, which is based on Linux kernel. And your uh, uh, Mac book, which is running Mac OS, is based on the Linux kernel. So this guy is eventually won in the long run. So they won the battle uh, over commercial software. And uh, there was uh, this internal fight uh, between, uh, I'm not getting into details about this also because it's late, but there was a very interesting fight between the open source movement, which is similar uh, to what is happening right now with Bitcoin and blockchain. Basically, there was these guys in uh, Netscape, uh, and they said, yeah, open, free open source software is better than proprietary software because the peer review is better, the security is better, uh, it's great, it's producing more, uh, more rich development, but uh, they are too much ideological. So these guys, Richard Stallman with, with his beard, they, they are too ideological. They are like, they are activists. We don't like them because they are bad for business. So we want to create some alternative which is, looks like a little bit like neutral, uh, more technological, more business oriented, less, less ideological, less political. And so they created the open source initiative uh, and then Richard Stallman created the Free Software Foundation, and they fight among each other because some guys, they want to promote open source just as a pragmatic choice. So there is a, this very good book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, by, by Eric Raymond, and uh, The Cathedral and the Bazaar basically states that uh, for a big project, uh, uh, the, uh, the open, uh, natural, organic growth by free people interacting without the gov strict governments is it, better and can produce more things and better things than the centralized hier hierarchical company uh, organization. And so this, mo this movement started, and this movement started to uh, also try to, uh, to discuss money in the, in the, in the early 90s. Like, uh, why are we using different currencies in different countries? Can't we just have a single open source standard? So these guys were all about standardization, open standards. So why is, pe is not people allowed to use a single open, permissionless, interoperable standard? Uh, then there is the last, the last movement, which I call the movement for, for uh, smart money, uh, aka the startupper. So these were people that were basically, they were city, typical Silicon Valley innovators. You can recognize the, the first one in the, in the list is Elon Musk. Now, these days he's pretty famous for a lot of things, including uh, sending things in the space uh, or, or, or hydrogen cars uh, or, or electric cars, Tesla. But uh, Elon Musk started with a very ambitious program in the, in the 90s called X.com. X.com was basically this. It, it was something like th this idea. Uh, money is old. It's a very old uh, industry. Banks are old. Central banks are old. They are static, lazy, slow, uh, legacy, uh, uh, uncomfortable. So we want to disrupt that industry. Since we are Silicon Valley disruptors, we want to disrupt this industry. We want to move fast and break things and change completely how money works. Uh, the same things went for Peter Thiel that was the creator of Coinify, and they merged together to create PayPal. And the first idea of PayPal was a kind of money that was uh, uh, completely independent from the American Federal Reserve. So the, their idea, the, there is a speech from, from Peter Thiel in the 90s that says, I don't want PayPal to move US dollars, because US dollars are perceived in, for example, if you go in China, they are perceived like American money. 
we want the internet money, the citizen of the internet, he will use the internet kind of money, not the um, US kind of money, not the U European kind of money. Uh, the internet is a new world, and we are going to provide this new world with our different rules. So this kind of culture was a little bit less political, if you think about that, it's, uh, but it's political. I mean, uh, Silicon Valley is a highly politi politicized environment, but uh, the, it was mostly about business and about technology initially. So you can have some kind of, uh, uh, you, can, you can divide this culture in different ways. For example, I, uh, and now I'm, I'm closing, uh, I, I, I had fun to find the, the middle way between, uh, between the, the, different, uh, the different steps. For example, uh, some, uh, the, the libertarian, uh, the typical uh, anarcho -capital, American anarcho-capitalist political activist, is somehow between the Austrian because he cares for sound money and he fights against central banks, but also cypherpunk because he cares for privacy and free markets and permissionless and, and, and victimless crime. Or, or whatever. Then there is the hacker, which is a little bit in between the cypherpunk and the nerd, because he cares for Linux kernel, but also for uh, strong cryptography. Then there is the technologist, which is uh, a little bit in between the nerd and the startupper. And then there is, and you can. The, the interesting thing is that you can find. Uh, it, it's interesting to study this kind of culture in Bitcoin because when you go. Uh, in, to Bitcoin conferences, when you interact with Bitcoin people, you can find people coming from all these different places. And you can say, like, this guy, he was, uh, 10 years ago, he was only talking about the gold standard and Hayek and von Hayek and von Mises, and now he's talking Bitcoin. This guy was al always talking about legalization of marijuana and, uh, and privacy, and now he's talking about Bitcoin. This guy was al also always talking about Linux and open source and standards for everybody, and now is talking about Bitcoin. And this is an entrepreneur that was trying to disrupt the industry in the 90s, and now he's talking about Bitcoin. Of course, there is another, uh, I, I, if I want to close the circle and try to connect the Austrian with the startupper, you find another kind of human type that you always meet in the Bitcoin conferences in Meetup, which is the speculator, is the less political of, of, of all, and he's just basically interested in, in making money and driving a Lamborghini. But uh, all, the others, all the others are pretty political, actually. So I'm closing with the last slide, and then finally we can go to the questions, uh, if you are not uh, just fading down and passing away already. Uh, so uh, the, the thesis of this slide is that you cannot have dark money if you don't also have hard money, because, uh, uh, for example, in 1990, David Chaum, he, tr he created eCash. eCash was a private way to exchange money already in 1990. It was even more private than Bitcoin. But what was that money? That money was basically a digital check issued by a commercial bank. So even if it was impossible to, uh, to track and spy and censor people moving e cash, it was just possible to go to the, to the bank and tell to the bank, uh, you shouldn't uh, issue this, uh, this kind of uh, digital checks. And so it was super easy to censor it down because uh, if you are using the government money, even if you create a way to transact government money in a way which is not easy to censor and to track, still you are using something that at the root is super easy to manipulate to censor, so it didn't work. The same goes the other way. So if you, uh, there is people that try to create hard money without it being dark money. For example, there was uh, people issuing gold certificates uh, in the, when, when the, the US dollar started to be ma heavily manipulated. So uh, the government wants to manipulate the money. Okay, we're just using gold, so we are safe from manipulation. Uh, but then they got all arrested, basically, because there was a law that made the possession of gold certificates illegal. And you can find a, a recent history about something called e-gold. If you search on Wikipedia about e-gold, so e uh, dash gold. It was an oncologist, an American oncologist, that he was a, he was a gold lover, and so he said, "I will create a, a an internet service that will make people able to exchange uh, gold denominated certificates online." And he was actually arrested for counterfeiting. There is a uh, if you go on Wikipedia and search for the legal. Uh, debates over him, it's crazy, like uh, he was not selling dollars, he was clearly selling gold, and there was really gold, so it was not uh, fr defrauding anybody, but the Federal Reserve say that uh, uh, he was violating the monopoly and counterfeiting dollars, so he, he actually went to jail uh, for that. So uh, you cannot do hard money 
if it's not also dark, because the government will try to censor your hard money, because the government loves easy money, because the government can produce easy money. Uh, same goes for open. The only way you can have an open standard is if you also have an hard money and dark money. This is another, uh, this is a long discussion that I will not try to demonstrate right now. But there is a problem. Uh, dark money and hard money and, and, and open money is not always very compatible with smart money. What does it mean? It means that when you want to do startup things like uh, Silicon Valley things, you want to do magic money, which is ultra uh, super programmable, and you want smart contracts, uh, and you want uh, technology evolving every year. This kind of, uh, this kind of uh, philosophy, this kind of culture is usually incompatible with uh, the other cultures, because if you want hard money, you cannot innovate. Uh, money is like the most boring thing uh, that you can have in the market. Basically, money is uh, th that one particular good that uh, the more it changes, uh, the, the, the worse it is. You don't want monetary standard to change because they are the base of every other interaction. So you want uh, convergence, meaning that uh, you, uh, in, in products, uh, you want competition. So if everybody here has a different product, that's better. We compete and we get better. In protocols, you want uh, uh, convergence. So I, I am speaking English. Uh, I am an Italian, uh, originally not as Itali an English speaker, as you can understand from my Oxfordian accent. Uh, you are originally probably German speakers. And we are speaking English because we are trying to converge over the same interoper interoperability standard. It's not that I'm talking uh, in my personal language and I say, let's just compete on the market. No, we, uh, in products, you want competition. But in protocol, you want convergence. And in, pro in products, you want fast evolution. So you want uh, this new app on my phone, but next year I want a new app, more powerful, different, because I got bored from the other one. But in money, you want to save your wealth for your kids and grandkids, so you want that the same kind of wealth storing device that is uh, usable right now, will be useful by my grandchildren, uh, which is something very different from products. I don't care if my cell phone is usable by my grandkid. I hope not. I hope they will have flying magical uh, cell phones. But uh, I do care that my denomination of money uh, that I'm storing right now for my grandchildren is still money when my grandchildren are there because it's intergenerational. So money needs to be boring. It needs to be... Uh, slow, uh, not fast evolving, and not very competitive, not, not divided in, in, uh, in 2,000 different uh, uh, flavors. In, uh, in order to, to work well, it must be basically one and stable, or a very few and possibly stable. So uh, many people that doesn't understand Bitcoin, uh, people coming from the hard money tradition, they understand Bitcoin. They wanted gold, and now they have the digital gold. People coming from the dark money tradition, they understand Bitcoin. They wanted to be private, they wanted to be censorship resistant, and now they can be, if they use Bitcoin properly. Uh, people coming from the open uh, money tradition, they finally have open source everywhere. Uh, uh, Bitcoin is great because, for example, let's imagine a Bitcoin wallet. It has to be open source. Because if it is not open source, you cannot, uh, you cannot review the security. And so it's like giving your Bitcoin to the, to the developer. So uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, a, is, a, is a new sector that is forcing the free open source standard over the industry, which is great. As Mir said, it's difficult to monetize on that, but it's great. But it's not uh, many people coming from the smart money tradition. So many people coming from the uh, yeah, yes, yeah, Silicon Valley uh, mindset. They don't get Bitcoin. Many startups and, and venture capitalists, especially from the US, they don't understand Bitcoin because they think about fast innovation and, and competition. I want to destroy this product every year and change it while money works exactly the other way around. It works with stability and convergence. So. Uh, I know it was long, but if some of you is still awake, we are both available for questions.